as far as being the trail being your training yeah absolutely but if you run into problems then that's just a sign from from the body that yeah. there's something that needs to be worked on in a way you're just repatterning how the body wants to move uh, or how the body moves naturally especially if your knee hurts it's probably not your knee it's probably somewhere else in your body that's out of whack out of balance that has you know mm. caused that pain welcome back peanut butter and mountain listeners so if you're looking to perform better in the mountains this episode is going to be for you our guest today is what I like to call, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later. We'll see if you agree. But I like to call him a hybrid mountain athlete who's renowned for his multifaceted approach to outdoor fitness. So today, let's welcome Chase Tucker, a.k.a. Chase Mountains, on YouTube to the podcast. Welcome, man. Thanks, Chad. Thanks for having me, man. I, I appreciate the name of the podcast. As soon as I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's a podcast I want to be on for sure. Oh, yes, dude. <laughs> I love it, man. There's not, yeah, it's like there's nothing better than peanut butter and then the mountains, right? And so it's like, that's why I did it. <laughs> it's a good combo. Yeah, it is. Well, like I said before the podcast, man, I've been following your YouTube content for a long time. And for folks that maybe haven't heard of Chase before, you know, he is, he's been on YouTube for a number of years and he does a lot of fitness stuff on there. He's also been short, sharing some different uh, short f films as well. And I just want to thank you for sharing your knowledge there because there's not a lot of people in that hiking fitness space that, that really talk about that. A lot of them that I've seen on through hikes and things are like the trail's going to get you in shape type of things like that. Right. And I just, I cringe when I hear that type of stuff. So yeah, man, I'm just I'm stoked to stoked to talk with you today. And like I said, I relate to you so much. And what I really see in you is that you're kind of what I like to refer to as a hybrid mountain athlete. Would you agree with that statement? Or what what would that statement, I guess, mean to you? I'm curious. <laughs> I'll definitely take that. Yeah. It sounds like a real sexy term. <laughs> and I think it speaks to variety, uh, which is what I really love. I don't, I don't yeah. like to coin myself as a, a, a hiker or a through hiker or even a mountaineer or an alpinist but i do a little bit of everything i also mm -hmm. do a little bit of rock climbing and the thing is i'm not like particularly good at any of them and yeah. i'm not particularly um committed to to any one sport i just love being in the mountains in any shape or a way shape or form and and i, I like to utilize these different skills that I've built over the years to explore the mountains in different ways through different seasons. Mm. So having a bit of a, you know, not only a, a very expensive catalog of gear, <laughs> but also, <laughs> but also the different skills that allow me to kind of do whatever the weather here in Spain allows me to do. Yeah, dude, that totally makes sense. Yeah. So you can extend your you being in the mountains basically all year, 365 days a year, essentially, because you now have all these different kind of skill sets that kind of can kind of take you through each season. What, what, uh, what's kind of been your like recent, I don't know, what's, what's your top sport right now? Do you feel like out of all of those, like, what are you most interested in? Mm, I'm probably most interested in, ice climbing because I've, I've had a decent winter and so i've had a couple of, of good sessions and we had some good uh thaw freeze periods so i've been ice climbing a little bit more than usual and I, that came about because i just found a couple of really good partners that i've mm -hmm. with really well and they they're a lot younger than me they're like in their early 20s and they were able to kind of push things and we communicate really well they're incredibly knowledgeable mm -hmm. So that just by coincidence, uh, you know, we met rock climbing. We just started chatting at the crag and then yeah. uh, he invited me out and I was like, you know, I've got all the gear, but I, I'm hideously inexperienced being an Australian in, in ice. Uh. And so over the years I've done a little bit, but I kind of got a, got a taste for it just in the last, in the last season. So I've yeah. been out a few times and it's been. Yeah, it's been super nice. <laughs> now, are you like looking at maybe any kind of uh, future goals where you kind of combine all of these disciplines into an objective? Because that's kind of like where I'm at right now. It's 
you know, I've learned to through hike. I, okay. I, I know how to feed my body. I know how to trail run long distances, right? I know how to do some rock climbing. I know how to do some rope work and things like that. So for me right now, what I'm trying to do is kind of combine all those disciplines into maybe one objective that I can use like all of those skill sets. Are there, are there any that kind of pop out to you in the future that you're interested in with that? Yeah. So there's, there's this idea that I have of, um, combining ultralight hiking with long sort of ridge scrambles that don't necessarily need too much gear or too much rope. So not, not so heavy on the cams and, and, uh, and, and gear. So, so that I could maybe take a short rope for repels, Mm. but do some long ridges that could potentially link up for, you know, like three or four days, not entirely ridges for three or four days, but maybe linking a series of ridges just to stay up high. Yeah. Because I found that through through hiking experience, you you can really only sustain about three to four days of good food. And so that's kind of the limitations that have been placed on me for, for this idea. Mm. So this summer, that's what we're looking to do actually with, with the same guys uh, who are interested in the same type of climbing uh, as me. And that would just allow for a big adventure that could be squeezed into a decent weather window and would be really adventurous and really kind of that fun, sketchy, uh, perhaps type two fun. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm looking, that's what I'm super excited about this summer. Well, and that's you, you had a a recent film kind of come out or or documentary. I don't know what you would want to call it, but of you doing a Ridge scramble, which was really, dude, it was very cinematic and I love the drone shots and everything like that. So I'm, I'm thinking that's probably similar to kind of probably what you're, what you're referring to. And one thing I wanted to touch on, you said good food for three to four days or so. What do you mean by that? Hmm. Well, (laughs) this could be a deep, deep rabbit hole, but the thing is with a lot of hiking food is that it's, uh, you know, ultra processed and it is quite hard to, to, to digest and it's very, not very nutrient dense. Yeah. So again, that sort of three to four day window allows me to take like relatively fresh food and uh, perhaps dried, you know, uh, jerky or dried fruit and, um, and still have like, you know, decent quality food rather than just eating ramen the whole time. Dude, that is, that's my issue with through hiking. I, hmm. I, you know, someday I want to do the PCT. I'm looking at the map right here on my wall, but I don't know if I can eat that bad for four months. It's not good for you. <laughs> That's for damn sure. Like all of this stuff is, is full of like uh, seed oils, like canola oil, sesame oil, like all these hydrogenated oils that are... Yeah, and there's a decent amount of science behind um, the correlation between a lot of uh, diseases and all-cause mortality right. and the introduction of seed oils, particularly in, in, in the States. I mean, it's just as bad here and all over the world, really. But uh, I, that's one thing I've been really kind of a lot more strict. I've never really had a strict diet, but I've been very strict on myself in the last like few months in, in terms of eating really... Uh, really good quality like actual food it, and oh i feel way better i was just gonna i, I was just gonna say amazing. what what what's the difference i mean do you feel quite a bit of big percentage difference than before uh yeah far better mood better sleep uh a better handling of my emotions mm. my emotional state in in terms of being able to <clears throat> being able to respond rather than react mm. uh, and, and in terms of the choices that I make on a daily basis about how I, must, how I spend my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, this is all very uh, unscientific, but it's just the things that you notice when you start to pay attention uh, that are important, I think, and it doesn't necessarily have to be so scientific or so uh, yeah. deliberate, but you can, you know you can make some assumptions about the changes that uh, that happen when you start to change what you put in your body and uh whether it's placebo or not who knows but the fact is if you feel better you you feel better and then you keep doing what you're doing yeah well and that's that's probably a really good segue into 
some of the breath work stuff that you've been doing as well and kind of integrating into your fitness routines and your trainings and stuff like that. So I'm super interested in this. We were talking off podcast about NSDR, like, which is like Andrew Huberman brought it up and, you know, napping type of stuff. It's not really napping, but I don't know. You probably know way more about it than I do, but I'm just curious on, yeah, some of your insights on, you know, breathing techniques, how you've been integrating that into your mountain activities and like the benefits you've been seeing from that. Can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, so I, I get questions very, very regularly about uh, how can I improve my fitness for hiking? And what they are usually referring to is how can I, uh, how can I hike to the extent that I don't have to breathe so much, that I don't have to stop and catch my breath. That's what, usually that's what hikers are talking about when they're talking about fitness, right? The thing is that the way that you breathe during rest, during sleep, will not really change with the onset of increased cardiovascular fitness. Like with, with typical running high intensity drills, yeah, we can make some improvements in fitness, but it's not really going to change the way that you breathe during rest. On the, on the flip side, if you improve the way that you breathe during rest, during sleep, during work, during a podcast, that will have an effect on how you breathe in higher intensity activity. Mm. So it's, uh, I don't want to get caught up in terminology, but usually when people are asking about fitness, what they're really referring to is respiration. And so I've, I've dedicated the vast majority of my research time in the last couple of years for learning and experimenting with the oxygen advantage method. And I've interviewed the founder, Patrick, on, on my YouTube channel. And I went through his, a couple of different courses and I'm now an advanced instructor in that. And so now over the last two years, I've been sort of integrating that into my mm. programs and in my, in my coaching with incredible results, by the way. Interesting. So you're saying, so you teach them more how to breathe at rest, which then translates to better, essentially cardiovascular fitness when they're actually doing hiking and stuff mm. like that. How, how do you do that? Or what, what is, is it diaphragmatic breathing types of, I'm very, very ignorant to this. So, I mean, by <laughs> all means, like, you know, crush me with what I'm saying in my terms, but yeah. How, how is it that you're doing that? <laughs> uh, mostly I, I make pre-recorded audios and videos. You could think of the, they're kind of like meditation sure. where I would record an audio or a video um, and give it to my clients and so that's the basis level like learning how to breathe at, at rest then we can get into more intense stuff when we can actually start to integrate um, breath holds and hypoventilation low meaning low so breathing less whilst doing an activity like hiking or climbing or running or whatever so the idea there is to breathe less at rest and then also as you increase in your activity to also breathe less. Mm. And so what that brings about is mainly biochemical changes in the body. So there's an interesting relationship between carbon dioxide and oxygen that uh, when we disturb those blood gases and when we improve the body's ability to tolerate carbon dioxide better, we then are able to do more work with less respiration. Mm. What the heck? That makes sense, <laughs> right? That makes sense. You just, yeah. you, you never, you never, you don't really, you, you take it for granted, right? I mean, cause you've just been breathing all your life. So you're just like, oh, I just, I just breathe, right? I think in one of the videos I think I was watching, or maybe, I don't know, I can't remember if it was yours or not, but it would this help folks at altitude as well? Yeah, yeah, potentially. What most people are worried about when they're at altitude is altitude sickness and uh, and the symptoms that go along with that, which is fair. There is, we can't really definitively say that you're going to suffer less from altitude uh, by doing these practices. However, we can simulate a low, alt uh, a low oxygen environment through the training. Mm. So it is a form of simulated altitude training simply mm -hmm. by breathing less. Mm -hmm. 
And so the more that you practice that, like, you know, athletes will do this, they'll go to Denver or whatever, and they'll have a training season there because it's essentially a lower oxygen environment and their body's adapting to that. Mm -hmm. And so that's not going, that's going to be far more effective than just doing what I do, which is like, you know, half an hour, an hour a day where we're disturbing blood gases Mm -hmm. and uh, doing reduced breathing during exercise. Mm -hmm. So over time, yeah, we see improvements in breathing and improvements in breathing will relate to better performance on the mountain and perhaps uh, better utilization of the limited amount of oxygen and altitude. Hmm. But it's very early in the, in, the, in the piece here. There's not a whole lot of research that's been done on it. So it's very difficult for me to say, and perhaps irresponsible of me yeah. to say that, yeah, this is this is great for altitude. Yeah. But I think the reality the reality is that you improve your breathing um, at sea level, then likely your that will be maintained in altitude as well. Totally, makes and that's been my experience. Yeah, totally makes sense. Let me ask you this: Do you use mouth tape when you go to sleep? Yeah. Do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Has have you noticed a difference with that? I mean, you have to. Uh, I think. Using it. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it's really hard to say where the improvements come from the, the the practices that I do, whether it's from nutrition, whether it's from training, or yeah. or uh, or taping the mouth, or any other, you know, sauna, cold, all the other things right. that I do. But it's um, if you think about the amount of time that we that uh, that we spend in sleep, you know, it's a third of our lives, and I like to think about it like. Well, you get eight hours of free breath work training mm, without doing anything cool. other than putting a t- tiny bit of cheap tape on your mouth. That's cool. And, you know, you don't need to buy... Like, I get ads for, for the, these um, mouth tapes and perhaps they're a little <clears> bit better with the type of adhesive they have or whatever, but I just I just use, like, regular, uh, like, Luco tape. Oh, uh, do you really? Like physio tape. Yeah, yeah. Does it rip your lips? I buy packs of 20 of them. No. No. <laughs> no. My girlfriend uh, uses it every night and she, she has quite sensitive skin and she doesn't complain about it. So <laughs> if, she, you know, if it's not bothering her, then it's not going to bother most people. Gotcha. <laughs> She's pretty picky. Oh my God. That's hilarious. Dude, that's hilarious. Well, well, this is cool. I mean, just kind of understanding so far in this conversation, you have a very holistic, obviously, approach to your health. And like your longevity and stuff like that. And if I'm not mistaken, you're almost you're almost forty, right? Yeah, I'm forty in uh, in January. D- yeah. Dude, you hundred percent look at least five years younger than than your age, which is is always I feel like a <laughs> it's very kind. yeah, it's always a very big compliment though. I mean, because I think that that is a compliment for how you take care of your body holistically, you know. And I always sometimes I'll get that I'm. 26 or 27 or something like that and i'm like dude i love that you know it's like fitness has been such a big (laughs) part of my life and really being healthy the last five six years has has been a big part of my life so it's uh yeah it's cool to see i mean you can see right now folks it's paying off right (laughs) it's paying off so uh (laughs) it's probably just good genes as well (laughs) (laughs) so my dad my dad's like uh 70 something and he's still in pretty good shape. oh really and so that's also, you know, got, got a lot to do yeah. with it as well. I'm perhaps lucky in that sense. Well, dude, I mean, again, dude, it's very obvious you take care of yourself. I mean, can you, like, I mean, if you go to his YouTube channel, you've got, you know, a ton of uh, different, again, walkthroughs of training techniques, fitness programs, things like that. You run your own fitness program, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But what is your typical training program for... I mean, the fact of the matter is you're doing, again, a lot of things in the outdoors. So, you know, if you were doing just a through hike, you'd probably be different than if you were training to kind of be this multifaceted person in the outdoors. So what is your training regimen currently? Like, how do you break it down day by day? What are you looking to increase? And yeah, I'm just just curious because it is kind of difficult. It's like hard to focus on one thing at, you know. When you're doing so many things in the outdoors, the uh, you might be surprised by this, but I I don't really do a lot of structured exercise in, in terms of what you would expect from an average kind of personal trainer uh, or a strength and conditioning coach. So, 
really at the moment, uh, my I know my body really well and I know my personal needs and I know my strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so I have a, a decent strength base because I was a strength coach spending, you know, 12 hours a day in a gym for six years lifting weights. So I'm pretty happy with the level of strength that I have, both in my lower body and upper body. So I don't tend to do a lot of strength training. I'll go through phases where I'll do maybe six to eight weeks of a fair bit of deadlifting and the, the typical stuff. But, you know, right now I'm, I'm spending a lot of my time and effort <laughs> getting, getting better at relaxing. Mm. Because over the years, I've sort of discovered that I do have quite a lot of just resting tension in my body for one reason or another. And so I'm, I spend a lot of time uh, getting better at relaxing whilst moving. Mm. So it, you could look at what I am doing currently, and I'll put a video out soon that sort of shows in more detail what I'm doing. But it's very similar to, if you saw it, you would think it's Tai Chi or Qigong. Sure. So what I'm, what I'm aiming to do and what I'm spending a lot of my time on now is really marrying up the, the Eastern traditions with uh, both yoga and Tai Chi Qigong with Western science to try and understand how and why and if it, it would be beneficial. And for me so far, it's been incredibly beneficial. Mm. And it's not to say that this is the most optimal thing to do. Like it's going to be different for everybody. Mm. But for me personally, that's what, I know I need to focus on. So, yeah, I, I, my average day usually starts with like a 15, 20 minute kind of Tai Chi, Qigong inspired movement sequence. Okay. And I'll generally follow that up with a little bit of just uh, reduced ventilation, sort of calm breathing. So, breathing less than I would ideally like to. Mm. And that brings on the kind of stress response from the body because you're holding on to a lot more carbon dioxide. But then you kind of use this manual override where you teach yourself, you're like, yep, I'm feeling the stress from not breathing, but I'm also calm. And this plays in really well to climbing and, and mountaineering. Dude, right. Because <laughs> it, 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 it's just teaching you how to relax. And sure. what what happens when, when someone is hanging on? Oh, dude. And they're over, they're over climbing and they're getting all this tension in their muscle. <laughs> What's the belaya saying? Relax. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, what do you need? Just take, take a moment, take a breath. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm practicing. Um, other than that, it's yeah. Walking, running, enjoying myself, doing the thing, like do, doing, doing the thing, man. Like yeah, <laughs> getting out and hiking and trying to get out every weekend. Yeah. And it's not just, I don't really consider that training. That's just fun. Like I go out and do it, but in, obviously that's, this is what I'm training for. So it's, it's training in some respect, but it's certainly not, not structured really. Interesting. So you, so you're not doing too much. I mean, you do, sounds like you do some periodization of weight training, but for the most part, it's, you're not really touching weights in the gym, lifting weights in the gym. Not currently. Uh, if we dial back six months ago, uh, yeah, I was hitting the gym every day. Interesting. And uh, in probably two to three months, I'll be doing the same. I... I'll go back to literally, yeah, I'll get a gym membership and I'll lift weights for eight weeks. How do you just to stay on top of the strength? I was going to say, how do you period how do you periodize that? I and mean, is it kind of around your objectives of what you want to do for the year type of thing, or? How do you how do you figure out that? Um, I don't really pay that much attention to periodization, to be honest. Uh, I I will you know you can program deload weeks and you can get really nitty gritty about the details, but at the end of the day, uh, your progress is going to be de determined by your lifestyle and your routines. Mm. And I usually I'll find that there will be some week there where I'll have to be away for a trip or. Uh, you know, I'll take a holiday with the, my partner and my family or whatever. Sure. And I won't, and I'll just have like a natural deload week. So I, I really don't fuss over the details and I don't fuss over the details with my clients. The, what I focus on is habits and routines and, and making sure the work gets done. Like when, when I am, you know, doing heavy strength-based training, it's very simple. I walk into the gym and I lift things up and I put them back down. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I continue to do that until I'm tired. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> it's real simple. Yeah. 
dude. I, I get that, man. I know, like, when I used to lift heavier in college and stuff, people would be like, oh, man, how do I how do I lift like you or how do I look like you? I'm like, I mean, it's pretty easy, dude. You just freaking select a couple exercises and you, you keep going until it hurts. You have to, let, you know, let it down on the ground. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, you know. I have been – I will, yeah, I, and pe- people try and make it rocket science yeah. though. That's the thing. Like they, they they get very caught up in the details because there's a lot of people like me who are you know begging for your attention and putting lots of complex information out there. But at the end of the day, it's it's much more important. You know, have have two good routines. One that's like an upper body dominant one and a lower body dominant one. Yeah. And fucking repeat them. Yeah. And repeat them and repeat them and, and don't change it. Like. My clients have come to me and they're like, oh, I need to update my program. No, you don't need to update the program. You need to go into the gym and you need to lift the weights. Absolutely. This is stop changing the program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. I uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Uphill Athletes. They have a, a really, mm-hmm. really good book. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I have taken a couple of their workouts, like their muscular endurance workouts for my lower body and my upper body, actually. They have this Ice Beast workout. I actually just did the Ice Beast yesterday. <laughs> you done that one? Nice. That one is. No, no, no. I used to do this stuff a, a long time ago, and like it, a lot of their work informed what I do. Um, but, yeah, uh, I've just, like, I've started to source information from mm-hmm. different people, obviously. But I have a huge amount of respect for Stephen and uh, Scott. Yeah. Dude, they know their shit. I mean, that no that shit. book, I mean, if I could require <laughs> one book for anybody to read before they get into mountaineering or anything like that, and they really want to look at fitness and stuff, like it would be training for the new alpinism. I loved, I love that book. And I, I constantly am going back into that, but yeah, I, uh, they're freaking ME workouts, man. They will leave you on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the theories that they that they go into, um, in quite a lot of detail in the book is still holds up and like that book's been around for a long time and they managed to circumvent a lot of the hype that was around their intervention uh the high intensity interval training that happened around the time that that book was released and they were just like what's this there's no such thing as a free lunch that's ex- and it's like yeah, there was that. It was that. It was that article from a guy that tried to get a free lunch by just doing hit training all the time, and he mm. realized that he just was still getting smoke zone two long duration stuff. He just couldn't. Mm. He couldn't sustain it. It was just. It was a different type of training. You're totally right. Yeah, I remember that article. Yeah, and that that portion of the book really was the beginning of me understanding how important nasal breathing was. I think that was really the first time that I had read. Uh, detailed literature about the importance of zone two cardio breathing through the nose uh, what they refer to in at least my version of the book was conversation pace and uh, that informed my training for a really long time and from there I got into the work of Dr. Philip Mathetone I was I still am a, a huge fan and a proponent of his work and that was really I remember him saying something a few years ago or at least I read it in a book he was like uh there, and I'm misquoting this terribly, but he was like, eventually, if you learn to breathe correctly, you will not have to worry about long-term chronic injuries like uh, muscle, sore, uh, muscle, chronic muscle tension, joint pain, that kind of thing. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty bold statement, bro. <laughs> like, this is maybe uh, eight years ago. But now, like with what I've understood, I'm like, he's actually probably right <laughs> as far as i'm concerned and with, with the experience that i've had from myself and my clients um it's not to say that it's the magic pill for everything because there's no magic pill but it is very very clear the role that the diaphragm plays as a stabilizing muscle in the body and, it, and so you simply cannot start addressing muscular imbalances and postural issues without first being able to recruit the diaphragm be simply because of the fact that it stabilizes the pelvis and the rib cage, and if your two major skeletal bodies are out of whack because the diaphragm isn't stabilizing them correctly, then all of this little, you know, these ones that you're doing band work and all this physio stuff is going to be completely pointless unless we first 
identify that there's no respiratory issues and there's no issue with the diaphragm. If you, if you fix the diaphragm, if you get it to uh, amplify the diaphragm correctly and properly, the likelihood is that the pelvis and the ribs are going to be stabilized. That's the center of the body and it can flow out outwards from there. And that's without even talking about what's happening at the, at the scapula, at the collarbone, uh, with the upper respiratory muscles, with neck issues. It's phenomenally important. And, and so what, why would I continue to spend all of my time on periodization and all the fancy stuff when I could actually put more time and attention into learning how to breathe properly. And people will be like, oh, I don't need to learn how to breathe. Yeah, you do. (laughs) Because you're probably breathing through your mouth half the day. You're snoring at night. And the, the sad thing is that people that breathe in that way often will be more reactive and more stressed and more anxious. And they, and they will find it they will have a limited ability to focus and take in new attention. So it's like this, it's a, it's a cycle that continues. And to say that breathing isn't important simply because it happens naturally without us doing anything about it does not mean that we can't improve it. So in our, do you kind of think about training the diaphragm as a muscle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a lot, very large muscle. Yeah. So, cause it's not typically what we would think of as a, as a, as a muscle because it's very different in, in how it's, uh, how it works. But yeah, you could think about breathing as strength training for the diaphragm. Yeah. Okay. Like expand. Like, is there a way to like expand your chest cavity a little bit larger? Or I, I don't know. Maybe expand your chest cavity a little bit larger with uh, this. Ian, Ian Macro. That's him. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So I was... He's excellent. Yeah. So he's got... And so actually I was going to ask you about this too is he talks a lot about cars or controlled articular rotations. Yeah. I was going to ask if you if you do any of that. I actually do it every single morning. I just go through a little routine and I actually... Now I'm starting to do it with like little wrist weights and stuff, you know, and then put them on my ankles as well. Mm-hmm. But do you do a lot of cars? Do you do that in your stuff? Uh, I wouldn't, I, what I would do probably wouldn't be categorized under the strict definition of that. Yeah. But if you saw me doing what I'm doing, it's, it's, it's very similar, um, very, very similar results mm-hmm. because what, uh, what you're doing is if you're relaxed and you're moving, uh, with respect to, uh, how muscles naturally shorten and tighten. If you are using momentum and gravity and uh, consciously uh, aiming to do that without creating more muscle tension, then in a way you're just repatterning how the body wants to move uh, or how the body moves naturally. And uh, this is what I'm really interested in because there's there's you know thousands and thousands of years in, in history with this stuff from the east but it's not very well understood by the west but thankfully now uh, it has been there's, there's a bunch of different different physiologists that are matching up this uh the the information that, that we have scientifically with the with the history of things like yoga and tai chi and, and qigong man this is so interesting because i've just kind of realized how maybe niche this stuff can be because you know ian (laughs) it's like and i've communicated with him quite frequently when i was doing his program and stuff and he was very helpful to me i'd see well he was on youtube as well he's been on youtube for a a while with some of that stuff Mm -hmm. but it is kind of funny like how (laughs) kind of niche this can be it's a small world yeah (laughs) yeah it's cool that you mentioned him as i don't know him uh, personally but i do follow him fairly closely and i I have a great deal of respect for the work that he puts out. Yeah. And from, from what I can see, it seems to be very, like pretty much self-informed through practice and observation of human movement, which um, is very different to how typical strength coaches obtain their information. Because most of what we know about the human body has been determined through dissections and observing the, the, the dead body, the corpse. 
but a dead body doesn't move and it, it certainly <laughs> if you do move it it moves very different to a live human body so the study of human movement is very uh very separate from the, the typical world of strength and conditioning which is mainly based on understanding the body through dissection yeah Oh man, that's cool. I'll have to I'll have to send him this clip. He'll be like he'll be he'll be pretty stoked yeah. about that, man. That's cool. Man. I would be I'd be stoked to be on his radar. I got a huge amount of respect for him. But please, if you're interested in this stuff, go and have a look at uh, Ian Macro. He's, yeah, yeah. he's phenomenal. Yeah, no, I'll uh, I'll I'll connect you guys too as well after this podcast. But sweet. Yeah, man. Cool. So I guess I'm I'm kind of curious. Well, two things I'm curious about. One, I really want to jump into. How do you? risk in the mountains okay so i feel like the risk between a ridge scramble and a through hike is different right and as i have progressed through my i don't know what you want to call it my mountain journey i have moved towards (laughs) i guess essentially more riskier things if you want to call it that right how do you how do you think of risk nowadays you're 40 years old going to be 40 right uh you have a girlfriend sounds like you know dad is dad is still around how do you how do you think about risk now when you're going into the mountains wanted to pop in here quick to tell you guys about something that you are gonna absolutely love so for a limited time i'm actually offering my free outdoor goals notion template i'm actually selling this on etsy for eight bucks but I'm offering it free for everybody that's listening to the podcast right now for a limited time. I'm not sure when I'm going to be taking this down. What this is, is storing all of your information, like your flights, the dates that you're going to go, your calendar, your beta for the adventure, the partners you're going with. It assembles everything all in one area. There's no more fumbling around with trying to cross-reference notes that you got that you copy and pasted off of a blog on your Word document, but then you also have flights on your phone. It's all gonna be in one place. What I like to do with it, I like to create all my goals ahead of time, block out all those dates. I know when I'm gonna be going, I know what the goal is. It's uh, templated, so you have all the things that you need to fill out, like permits and everything in the actual database. So no worrying about having to recreate everything. And here's actually a quick email that I just received randomly from a person that actually picked it up he said your info has been the most helpful out of all of the hikers on various platforms that i follow specifically your outdoor goals notion template has been great not just for planning purposes but for motivation as i can see my next year's adventures in a snapshot i now use notion for organizing pretty much everything in my life including work so that's what we're trying to do for you guys we're trying to help you out and so again i'm offering this free outdoor goals planning list template for free for a limited time Grab it now in the show notes below. Back to the episode. Uh, I I think about it increasingly more as I get older, for sure. Yeah. I think I used to be fairly nonchalant about exposing myself to to falls and, and to risks, and I've been perhaps lucky enough to have close calls in lots of different situations. I've had very long falls, like you know, twenty foot falls onto the ground and. Really? And done a ex- yeah, yeah. Scrambling yeah. or what? <laughs> so no, just uh, a bad belayer. <laughs> he was a dear friend of mine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I fell on him and I broke his L four, broke his spine when I fell on him. Shut so, up. Yeah, I know what it's like to yeah, I know what it's like to fall for for a, what feels like forever, uh, and then eventually crash into someone. Um, thankfully, but he he got his. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he paid his uh, he paid his price, but he's fine. He climbs much harder than I do now. He recovered very well. <laughs> so wow, yeah, I've touched I've touched the risk in in lots of lots of different ways. And I as I get older, I'm certainly more conservative. Uh, but being in the situation of not having kids, I I definitely have the advantage of being able to responsibly absorb a little bit more risk than the average person my age because they would have kids and um and i do have plan i do plan on having kids and it'll probably happen in the next few years so i've got a you know a couple more years where i can kind of push the boundaries a little bit um and at which time i'll probably reduce reduce my exposure to to certain things but particularly in the climbing world or even in the scrambling world 
um, when you're in more risky terrain, risk ascent assessment is the uh, fundamental and it's a huge part of the excitement. It's a huge part of the, the intellectual part of climbing and also the emotional part of, um, of adventuring and climbing as well, because you're constantly dealing with your own uh, internal dialogue about the acceptable level of risk that you're willing to take. So it's, um, it's a dance. It's a beautiful dance. And like I said, a couple more years of, of risking, taking a higher level of risk, I think I've got, and then I'll probably calm down and do, do things that are a little bit safer, uh, at least and probably until, I'm, you know, uh, the kids are older and then I can get back into it again. <laughs> Very articulate. No, that was, that was really, really great insights. What, have you ever thought, cause I've thought about this too, is like, so if I do have kids, cause I like what I'm doing right now, but if I do have kids, I'm going to have to, like you're saying, like take it down a notch or a couple bars. Right. Hmm. Have you thought about like what specific activities would still light your fire? Because you still need to be it still needs to be engaging for me. I mean, if I'm going to go out to the mountains and stuff like I still need to have some sort of engagement and, and be stoked about what I'm going to be doing out there. Right. And like, mm. yeah, I don't, I'm just curious. Like, if yeah, you know I think any... that the vast majority of the stuff that I do is still, still well within the, uh, the acceptable realm, even as a father, I would say sure. the, the, the beauty of the Pyrenees is that there's very low objective danger. Um, hmm. Sure, if you go out in winter, there can be avalanche risks and stuff, but they max out at about 10,000 feet and there's no, there's a few glaciers, a few big glaciers, but they're not very busted up. And, and so it's a, it's a, it's a playground, man. Like, it's so, so beautiful and so, uh, so accessible and uh, very, very predictable weather patterns. Mm. So I'm very, very comfortable in that environment and also because I know it very well. But if I was to go to the Alps even, which is experiencing a, uh, a lot of turmoil in terms of the, the temperatures, that's a, a, that's a risk that I'm probably not even willing to take now because it's so unpredictable. And, um, you know, I used to take pretty regular trips to the Himalayas as well. Mm. And that's, uh, that's not something I'm too, uh, too happy with in terms of the risk for, for, for myself at the moment. So I'm really just enjoying my, my local playground and, and, um, I'm very, very comfortable with, with what's on offer there. And there's very few things that I, uh, that I feel like would be irresponsible other than like sketchy new routes that aren't very well protected. Yeah. No, that's so interesting. Cause <clears throat> I had a very high performing buddy. He's been to the Himalaya now a couple times. And the last time he went last year, he basically said, I don't know if I ever want to go back. <laughs> he said, he said, mm. man, it was kind of like, just, there's like a lot of death around. I don't know, is what he, he kind of said the Himalaya was. I mean, they didn't have anybody in their group that, that died, fortunately, but, you know, they lost, like, a horse in a crevasse, and they, I don't know, it was all this wild stuff, and he just said, man, I don't know if it's if it's worth the risk in the, over there anymore. And I, so, hmm. you know, when you said the Himalayas looks like a beautiful place, I'm not sure if I would, not sure if I could ever go there either. Yeah. I've had the unfortunate experience of uh, attempting to revive someone and uh, eventually having to put them, you know, shove their head into a helicopter, uh, not an ambulance helicopter, but just like a regular tourism, a tourist helicopter. And um, yeah, so I fully understand what he's getting out there. There is certainly a lot more death and the higher that you climb, the higher you go, the, the more death is apparent. And, you know, that, that may excite some people for obvious reasons, but it's not something that yeah. really drives me. Um, I don't get excited or it's not a positive experience and it's not a heroic thing to be close to death in, in my opinion. So yeah. I'd rather just do things that are, you know, fun, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fun, <laughs> fun adventures that are yeah. like, yeah, a little bit risky, a little bit spicy here and there, but you know, at the end of the end of the day, you can 
drive home and right hug your family right sorry i'm getting a mm. freaking face whoops <laughs> one second i'm getting a facetime call here sorry jerk you still you can still see me oh yeah? good okay yeah man okay um yeah one second that came out of nowhere dude <laughs> I just got blown up. <laughs> Dude, that was so weird because it connected to my – because I have an iPhone, so it connected to my computer too. And I was just getting the ring of the phone in my ear as you were talking. I was like, holy shit. Okay. Hopefully that will be fine. I didn't hear it. So real good. Okay, sweet. We're back on long. Okay. Let me uh, – anyway. One thing that I would recommend I – can, I can pick up. What's that? Go ahead. One thing, uh, go ahead. The I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but the Whirl it's called W U R L. It's called the Whirl Wasatch Wasatch Ultimate Ridge Link Up. So it's a forty-three mile ridge link up in the Wasatch. Excuse me, in Utah, it's like right outside of the city, Salt Lake, and I mean it's. I haven't done it yet. Mediocre amateurs, I'm sure you've seen them on YouTube before. Yeah, they got, they have a really good video on it. Danny Danny did it. Uh, but if you're looking into ridge linkups and stuff, I think you would love that. The whirl. So might be something to, to write down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna check it yeah. out for sure. <laughs> so So I'm I do plan on getting over to the States at some stage as well. Like um the, the details are fuzzy at the moment, but I would really like to go to trail days and some of these other events not only oh, as yeah. just like a businessy networking thing but also right. just to, there's so many characters um that i would love to meet like in person like uh i i've been i've been on emery's podcast i love him we get yeah me really too well. i'd love to I'd, I'd love to meet him and i'd love to meet darwin and you know the, the, dan and kyle and all these guys that i um uh, who are my peers, you know, because I don't have that many people on this side of the uh, side of the planet who are doing this in English. And, and so that's, that's where I feel like my people are. I definitely want to get over there at some stage. Oh dude. Yeah. Heck yeah. I was, uh, me and Emery have chopped it up quite a bit. He's been, uh, I think he's been on my podcast a couple of times, three times or something like that. I've been on his a couple of times. Uh, real, real funny guy, real good dude. He's got really good opinions too that, uh, we chopped up. Yeah, there. I'm gonna have to hit him up for dad advice as well. Like we were talking earlier yeah. about the ex- accessible level of risk and what you do when you have kids. And I, I think because he's got kids of various different ages, so he's sort of. I think he's now able to take them out and do do some some trips as well, which I'm actually super excited about. Really, I would welcome the opportunity to to calm things down and and to be in an environment where you have these beautiful little beings that are so curious to everything around you and it would just enable you to see things with a completely different perspective and so i'd I'd welcome that yeah yeah i'm on i'm still on the fence about kids i don't know we'll see i i got some time i'm 32 it's it's a difficult thing hey it is man it's like it's also yeah yeah it's it's like do i want to when do i i like that you're kind of in that mindset like yeah I'm, i'm i would welcome you know, lowering it down a little bit, being a little more calm. Right. Mm. And I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm there yet, but I could see myself eventually getting up there. I think one of the things when I asked you, you know, like what are maybe some of the hobbies that you would take up if you had kids, I think I would probably get involved in hunting actually more because I like the love, the organic Mm. meat. I mean, there is nothing better than some elk Mm. steak. I mean, you're talking about nutrition. Oh my God. And so, Mm. I think that would be a little bit more low key for me. And right now when I think about hunting, I'm like, Oh, but there's so many other cool things to do in the fall. It's great rock climbing. It's great this and that. And so, Mm. you know, I've been trying to kind of try to kind of figure that stuff out, but that's cool to see kind of hear where you're at with it. Yeah. I've never really thought about doing, um, doing that, uh, with a kid, but like, I guess I grew up with, you know, guns in the house, mm-hmm. small guns in the house, and I would, um, I would like shoot birds in my backyard. Yeah, oh, yeah, we all did. Not native birds, like pest, pest birds. Yep. But um, 
I think there's there's a lot to be learned from hunting as well. I'd be super interested to get into it because breathing is a huge component of that in terms of like when you pull the trigger, being totally like you need to be totally relaxed and calm, I imagine, when you're and quiet, you know. And so that being in that situation where you are required to be perfectly still and to observe nature, I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of negativity around hunting. Mm-hmm. But there's also a lot of positive aspects for mm-hmm. it as well, and like you could talk about like bow hunting. I was gonna say you would well. love That's bow. Like whole you level. would love bow hunting. If we're talking about <laughs> breathing and concentration, you would love it. Love it. Hmm. It's just every time I you know, I get excited about something like this, I'm like, oh, can I have another hobby? Like, I'll be too. <laughs> can I have another closet full of gear? Um, <laughs> so I have to take. Uh, take that into account whenever i'm uh, getting too excited about a potential new sport but <laughs> yeah the, the hunting the hunting in um in the pyrenees is like pretty pretty good mm-hmm. like we don't have those like the big game mm-hmm. but um we have uh we have it like a decent sort of uh, community of hunting here and so yeah potentially something i'll get into we'll see and i i've um I was a vegetarian for, for eight years. And so if you would said that to me a couple of years ago, I'd be like, no, nah, I don't want to kill animals. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's part of human nature. Like we are, we are killers mm-hmm. like, like it or not. Um, we are, you know, we do benefit from, from eating meat mm-hmm. and we've done it forever. So it's, uh, it's something that, you know, you can deny for sure, and I didn't deny it for a long time. And I have full, absolute respect for vegans and vegetarians. Still, obviously, my girlfriend is a, a vegetarian, but it's uh, there is something very primal and very, very beneficial in it for sure. Yeah. So you kind of, what was it that kind of made that come full circle for you? Do you feel like uh, it was mainly, it was mainly just living in Spain and having very limited access to uh, vegetarian food because the culture here is very much based around meat. Mm. And so I eventually just kind of gave in because I found that I wasn't really able to feed myself with the quality that I would like to Mm. without meat. Mm -hmm. And and I found that I was eating a lot of um, processed food and supplementing, you know, if you have loads of time, then of course you can have a very healthy vegan or vegetarian diet but it does require a lot of time and effort and i simply sadly didn't don't have the time for it and it's just easier to eat you know good organic uh meat yeah well that'd be dude that would be cool Mm. to uh to get you into hunting i mean emery's a, a good resource with that too i'm sure um he's talked a lot about hunting before and so he's a good guy to hit up too about it but yeah that's uh that's cool every, every now and then i've trained uh hunters as well mm. a few hunters have come to me over the years and it's always really interesting because the you know the predominant um trend is to go ultralight now with hiking so most yeah. people are interested in lowering their base weight mm. but hunters are just like yeah i'm rocking out with like <laughs> 30 pounds or 40 pounds or whatever and then coming back with a, a deer right back. so you, you definitely need a, a an enhanced level of uh, strength and conditioning in that case but in, in my case what i'm doing now and for probably what most through hikers are doing there is um yeah sure you need a base of strength but it's a, a very limited um you don't need a lot what you need more is balance of strength mm. where where the where the stress is being distributed evenly through the body rather than on one particular point and so if you have really really uh, developed quads but your glutes and hamstrings aren't equally and opposingly that's me. strong that's me then that could potent- potentially result in uh overuse injuries interesting yeah what is uh we kind of talked about this before the podcast but what's your opinion on the trail will get you in shape for through hikers that quote uh if you're lucky it certainly will and um if you have perfect biomechanics and you've generally remained active and you've been doing a lot of sport and regularly moving, not doing a desk job, not driving a lot in a car, not experiencing a lot of lifestyle stress, then 
yeah, probably like it'll work out pretty well. But the reality is for most people is that's not the case. We are experiencing elevated levels of stress constantly. Um, many different uh, new stimuluses and exposures to substances and practices and lifestyles that we haven't done a lot of research on. And so that presents difficulties for the body. And when you expose yourself to doing 20 miles a day, those difficulties will appear in problems. And what I do is I try and foresee those problems based on people's habits and lifestyles to, to assume, okay, where would this likely weak link happen? Mm. Would it likely happen in the foot? Would it likely happen in the hips, knees or lower back? And how can we mitigate that as a part of a preparation mm -hmm. rather than my previous approach for many years was just like, hey, let's get strong as fuck and let's right. get you super, super fit. But now it's more about how can we balance this, this system out such that it distributes the, <clears throat> the stress evenly. Interesting. Okay, so, so you're kind of almost assessing for places places that might be a little bit weaker that you can kind of enhance a little bit and make it a full body multifaceted approach rather than just focusing on let's do a hundred thousand step ups because you're going to be going up the mountain yeah. <laughs> type approach yeah i did that for years <laughs> that was the basis of my training for years both for myself and what what i prescribed for other people so it was very much based around um yeah, your, your typical kind of squats, lunges, deadlifts, core strength with uh, high frequency of uh, weighted step ups or, you know, hill repeats or whatever. And that is still a huge part of what I do. Once we've identified that we've limited the, the potential yep. risks and um, I've injured many people by uh, providing a program that is quite high intensity that is available on my website for a small fee. <laughs> <laughs> and then without me having a <laughs> and without me doing a proper assessment of their health mm -hmm. they potentially run into <clears throat> issues and that's why i don't particularly promote those older programs and in some cases i've taken them off the website because i feel that they would be irresponsible just to throw out there <clears throat> without saying hey unless you're in like pretty good health this may be damaging to you rather than beneficial that's very responsible for you, of you, man. Very humble and responsible of you to say that, you know. <laughs> so, Go ahead. It's a tricky, it's a tricky situation because, you know, of course I, I want to provide people what they want, um, but as a health professional, I have to provide them what they need, and often they don't know mm. what they need. They come to me saying, oh, "I, I need to get stronger. I need to get fitter," but we, when we go through the process and look at the assessment results, it's like. Well, yeah, we can we can work on that, but first let's ensure that the fascia is healthy, that the breathing is functional, that uh, you're able to move well without pain, without stiffness, without uh, chronic muscle tension. And that when we get to that place, then we can talk about fitness. Then we can talk about performance and getting super strong and uh, doing more of the high intensity stuff. But until those uh, risks are lowered, then I can't responsibly say to you, push to your maximum yeah, level. Yeah. yeah, you need a base to work off of, right? Like it, the base needs to be healthy. The structure needs to be healthy before you're starting to do these these high intensity activities. You, you touched on fascia. Where are you at with like myofascial release and stuff like that type of things? Mm, it's It's been a consistent part of my programs for the majority of the time that I've been putting stuff out, I would say. Uh, I've increased my, my uh, frequency of providing that kind of information. And so what, what I will generally do now is when I'm looking at taking on a new client on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I'll be starting off by getting them to do a full body myofascial release for at least a month. Mm to clear the myofascial adhesions. No kidding. And so, yeah, and people don't particularly like that, but it's my role as a coach and a health practitioner to say, you know, 
we can put aside a month for this and see how it goes. Well, and it's just like what you said before. It's like what we what do after that is going to be way better. Yeah, like it's not what mm. you want. It's what you need. I loved how you said that right there, you know. So are you doing that with mostly like foam rollers, massage guns? How are you doing that? <clears throat> yeah, the vast majority of it is with a trigger point ball. So like a, a lacrosse ball and uh foam rollers sometimes some manual release with the hands as well like some self some self massage interesting yeah. interesting i uh i will say i have a standing desk i'm not standing right now but when i'm working i'll have a lacrosse ball for my foot freaking love it man mm. and if I, I it seems as though if i don't if i'm not regular with that i will i have more tendency for plantar fasciitis sometimes seems like yeah, I heard that in one of your previous, I don't know if it was a video yeah. or a previous podcast, but I uh, I think it's a very common thing for, for hikers and for sure the number one thing you can do is to get some activity happening on the on the plantar fascia yeah. and to uh, start loosening up that um, what is part of the superficial back line which runs all the way up through the back of the legs, through the spine, even all the way to the top of the head. And if you think about fascia as, it's kind of like a plastic bag right. that encompasses the whole musculoskeletal system. And it's, it's kind of, the, the analogy that I love is like a tablecloth. So if you imagine a tablecloth set for, you know, Christmas dinner with plates, cups, knives, forks, everything. If you were to pull on one corner of that tablecloth, then it's going to affect all of the other bodies on that table. And it's the same thing that happens in the body. So if there's a restriction in the plantar fascia or any other point for that matter, it's going to be uh, occurring. What is going to be recurring is a restriction somewhere else along that chain, perhaps in several different parts of that chain. And so the key message here is that nothing in the body operates independently. Totally. That's why doing a single stretch for a muscle or a single um, strength movement for for one muscle yeah it can be beneficial but also it's not really teaching the whole system to to understand its own movement capabilities and so that's why like a lot of the stuff that i do now is very total body based and movement based rather than just isolating one area of the body to stretch it or release it or to strengthen it yes dude i uh First of all, folks, if you if you had any doubts that Chase didn't know his stuff, you got you got to listen to his podcast. Go, this guy's dropping knowledge bombs left and right. But I uh, I have been studying anatomy and phys right now because I'm going to be doing kind of like a, a side gig with my buddy, and as a corrective nice. movement specialist type of thing. And that's cool. one of the things that I learned was, you know, especially if your knee hurts, it's probably not your knee. It's probably somewhere else in your body that's out of whack, out of balance, that has, you know, mm. caused that pain. And so when you made that analogy of like the, you know, the kitchen cloth or the table, everything, one thing always affects another thing in the body, it seems as though. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I've been getting really into recently is um, pain reprocessing therapy. So understanding how the emotional body is... Um, interacting with the physical body so in the in the in the west they understand uh, sorry rather in the east they understand this very well that emotions um and, and tension can be stored as a physical um, yeah. adhesion or a physical tension and so uh, this is all still very new to me but i'm going through some courses now to understand you know because i've worked with people for a long time and you know we've we've worked on all these things and there's still there's still limitations. So I'm like, well, what is there left to work on? And the thing that's left to work on after breathing, after my fascia release, after strength and conditioning and, uh, and all of these uh, protocols is, well, perhaps it's just in the mind. And it, it, sounds, um, it sounds kind of uh, dismissive to say that, like, oh, it's just in your head. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that the mind and the body is actually one entity and it's very clear that the uh, the restrictions or the limitations placed on the emotional component of, of the brain in particular can be uh, represented in the physical body. And to deny that is just 
stupid, really, in my opinion. Like if you think about, if I told you right now to think mm -hmm. about biting into a lemon, just think about hoofing into a lemon, what happens? What happens? I would be like, shit! <laughs> I'd probably be like... Yeah, so that's a physical... Yeah. <laughs> that's one physical res <laughs> physical response, but also probably what you find is that you salivate. So even just the just the idea, having the the thought in the mind of biting into a lemon. I see, yeah. That's producing, that's producing a response from the For body sure. where the brain is interpreting... The brain doesn't know the difference between reality and, and what you think. So it's going to respond to thoughts and emotions and, and feelings. So, you know, this is getting so far away from what would be perceived as relevant to hiking. But what's relevant to health is the, the whole body, yeah. and that includes the, the mind. Ah. Yeah, it's, it, um, I'm n nowhere near knowledgeable enough to talk about it on a deeper level. So maybe it's better <laughs> that we come back to this. But it's, it's been super interesting for me, um, you know, experimenting with the uh, more Eastern philosophies right. and, and meditation, yoga in particular. Well, like I said before, I mean, man, if you guys are interested in, in working with Chase, I'm going to leave some uh, his links down in the show notes below. But as you can kind of see, I mean, from what our, our whole conversation today, this is a very holistic approach. Like there is – we're not just – he's not just focusing on one thing. It, it's – we are focusing on how this affects this part of the body, that affects this part of the body, and taking it from all these different elements of the things. And so – with that, dude, I really, I really respect people that do that. And, um, yeah, I mean, you, you really showed today, like in this podcast, how knowledgeable you are with this subject. So I appreciate you coming on with this, Thank man. You. This was, uh, <laughs> this was super, super enlightening for me. And yeah. How can, uh, people catch up with you or where can they find you to sign up for coaching or YouTube, all that stuff? So uh, what I'm doing at the moment with this very holistic approach is that it's, it's very difficult, if not almost impossible, to just put this out as a program um, that has n no uh, interaction with me, which is what I've done for the last maybe six years. I mainly focus my time on producing a program that could be bought on a website and you know it's PDF or an app or whatever, and people just self-guide. The reality is with this stuff is that it's very complex and it takes a lot of going back and forth and trial and error and processes. So what I've done uh, since limiting my um, the amount of videos that I'm putting out on YouTube and Instagram, I've really dialed back from that. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I've put much more time and effort into working with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so that is called uh, the Hike Flow Method. It, there's no information on this online at the moment because I'm just very selective about who I take in. So it's usually people that just reach out to me with a problem. And I'm like, okay, well, let's let's workshop that. So that's the hike flow method. And then <clears throat> I'm going to clear my throat. Yeah. <clears throat> and then beyond that, if you go to my website, chasemountains.io, there you'll find um, a member, one membership called Momentum, which is the closest thing to the hike flow method. And I am tentatively putting more of this information in there for people that pay like a, it's either a monthly subscription or an annual uh, fee, whatever, whatever works for you best. But then there's all of my back catalogs yeah. from as early as, I think the earliest program was maybe 2015, wow. but I've been making programs since 2015. 13 nice. so there's a couple that have that i've retired and i'll continue to retire them when i when i see that they're perhaps the information is a little bit outdated but they're the sort of the cheaper ones the first ones um that really kicked things off with it was elements and that's still uh 35 dollars i think for a once-off fee so that that's a great place to start and um you know it's not it's not necessary or uh, the ideal thing for, for people to come in and do one-on-one -on -one coaching with me because my time is limited and it's I don't undercharge either. So for someone that has the resources and the will and the desire to change, then just reach out to me directly and we'll have a chat. Dude, the thing that I really respect about you and that's been very apparent in this podcast is you are on the cutting edge of a lot of the research and you are not so close-minded at all 
to where you're like, nope, this is the way you do it. You are very open in the fact of allowing new information to come in, new things to inform you with different ways of doing things. And those are the people that I really look up to and respect in any sort of discipline. I used to do jujitsu quite frequently. And, uh, you know, the coaches that were always, they were, they got their black belts, right. Which is kind of the end of the road, but they'd still do research on Mm -hmm. techniques and they'd still be learning and stuff like those were the coaches I wanted to be around because they were constantly getting in new information. And that's exactly what it sounds like you're doing in this type of stuff. And so, yeah, I just want to say that a lot of respect for me from there. Thank you, man. I I appreciate it. And I very much appreciate you uh, asking me on and I would encourage you particularly, but also anyone else who wants to be the next chase mountains, my position at the the, the top of this food chain of hiking fitness is up for grabs. And I would welcome competition because it's been far too long without anyone really challenging me or, um, sounds very arrogant to say that, but I think that's kind of the truth. Like there's no one else that's really been so specific about hiking. Yeah. Sure. There's, um, uh, mountain athlete. There is, uh, training for new alpinism and, and um, guys that are more into the alpinism mountaineering side. But as far as hiking is concerned, I feel like there needs there is so much more room for yourself and other people who are, have a deep interest, a deep interest in health and fitness and a deep desire to help people come at me. Like I, I need, we need more people in this, uh, in this space because hiking is a fundamental human movement pattern walking long distances is something that is inherent to the human experience we've been carrying our children we've been carrying our supplies and moving around this world for as long as we've been around and sadly we're losing it and so my work is about enabling that inherent ability which we all have and to, to speak about what you mentioned earlier is as, as far as being the trail being your training yeah, absolutely. But if you run into problems, then that's just a sign from, from the body that yeah. something that needs to be worked on. And I'm, I'm happy to help with that. And like I said, yeah, we need need more people uh, in this space. So yeah. get into it. Get into it. Cool. Awesome, dude. All right. I'm looking to hire coaches as well. I'm looking to hire good coaches. Interesting. So please uh, reach out to me. Interesting. Maybe we'll talk off, off podcast about that.